Hi guys, this week I'm going to overview the symptoms of diabetes and how you can get screened today because the sugar is too damn high. You're listening to The Purple Stethoscope. I am your host, Devin Nixon, family nurse practitioner. None of the information in this podcast is sufficient nor intended to diagnose your personal medical issue, but there's a lot to learn, so let's start the show. Mama, you know I love you. You know, you know, I love you, mama. Y'all know that song. That was the song from Soul Food, a classic black film where it was all about celebrating the matriarch of the family with the same food that killed her in the first place. Okay, now that I've got your attention. Did y'all ever notice that? Mm Mm-hmm. Big Mama and Soul Food had the sugars, the sugars, a.k.a. diabetes, diabetes mellitus. And that's what I have come to talk to you about today. It's me, DMP. Did you miss me? I miss you. And I've been thinking all week about what we should talk about next. By the way, go to my Instagram at D the NP and leave me a comment. Send me a message. Hit up my link in the bio and send an inquiry and tell me what you all want to hear about. I'm here for you, listening to you, giving back to you. All right. So today we're talking about that sugar. Mm hmm. I will put links in the show notes so that you all can read up in depth and find focused information on what your questions are because diabetes is a very broad and in-depth topic. There are several different kinds of diabetes. There's type 1, which if you're my age or older, you may have known as juvenile onset diabetes uh, because it typically comes on around puberty is when people notice it. Uh, There's type 2 diabetes, uh, an insulin resistance that usually happens. Well, they used to call it adult onset because it used to be seen mainly in people over 30 years of age. But uh, our children more and more are being diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. And it has everything to do with the kind of food they're eating and how much physical activity they are getting. There is um, gestational diabetes. If you've had a a big baby, uh, you might have been diagnosed with gestational diabetes. Um, Even if you didn't have a big baby, generally we see this in people who have nine pound babies um, or, or larger, but some people, you know, get diagnosed with diabetes during pregnancy and that may not be, um, gestational it may be something that's been there that they just didn't know about but when we're pregnant we tend to go in and be seen a lot more often Um, and there are other types there's like diabetes 1.5 it's really a broad topic but in the interest of keeping it simple I uh, just am going to talk about the symptoms and how we get screened symptoms for diabetes are thirst abnormal thirst, abnormal hunger, and abnormal frequency of urination, aka you're going to pee all the time, or your kid's going to pee all the time, or that student in your class is always asking for the bathroom pass. That player on your team can't get through a practice without having to run to the bathroom. They could drink a half a gallon of milk or water or whatever. They're always pouring something down their throat. Other symptoms include weight loss, fatigue, weakness, moodiness, feeling irritable or edgy. And I should say weight loss is, I I hesitate to include that one because um, a lot of people who are going to have type 2 diabetes are, are in fact overweight. So they may or may not have weight loss. Type 1 diabetes requires insulin to sustain life, point blank and period. That insulin is injected 
These are people who have monitors on their skin, um, can tell them their sugar all the time or alert them when they're starting to get low. Uh, some of the testing that I do in my job requires people to be in a fasting state. And uh, a lot of my type one diabetics, their monitors will beep, you know, they'll be beeping at me. And, and I'm like, ooh, you know, we got to get this done so we can get some food in you uh, because low blood sugar can be an issue as well when we think of diabetes, I think we tend to think about high blood sugar, but low blood sugar really is where you're going to get all your symptoms from. Interestingly, I have always had issues with my blood sugar getting too low. My youngest child was born with a low blood sugar and my dad had the same issue. And for me, I just feel like I can't help myself. Like I couldn't think my way out of a wet paper bag. I don't have a diabetes diagnosis. My A1C was 5.8 on my last check, which was just a couple months ago. And I will explain to you all what an A1C is and how you can get one. So sometimes symptoms are non-existent for people who have high blood sugars, um, but they may have frequent yeast infections or bladder infections. They may have blurred vision, tingling in the arms and legs, wounds that take a long time to heal. They may have um, dark areas on their neck, back of the neck, front of the neck, you know, just kind of darker than the rest of the skin. Those are some of the classic symptoms of diabetes. You know, it can come from, it can be an autoimmune issue in the case of type one, where you have beta cell destruction, you know, your body is destroying its own beta cells. Um, or in type two, it's typically genetic and environmental factors. What we eat has a ton to do with it. Our lifestyle has a ton to do with whether or not we develop type 2 diabetes. Um, and it's, it's hard for me sometimes to talk about these things because I know there is some shame surrounding any preventable quote unquote uh, diagnosis or disease. So when I say how we live our lives is a huge part of knowing um, whether or not we're at risk for diabetes, I don't mean that with any shame attached whatsoever there are food deserts. There are areas where fresh food is incredibly hard to come by. If you don't have a car, if you're taking the subway or taking the bus and you don't have a way to transport groceries frequently, um, that can be an issue. If you don't have a gym membership or safe sidewalks and parks where you can exercise, you know, this, this stuff that we kind of rattle off as being so simple is really not that simple when you factor in all the other things that we live with outside of the clinic. Um, if you are a parent and you go straight from work to pick up your kids from daycare or school or babysitter, you know, a lot of times it's hard to just get that time in for yourself. But when it comes to preventing diabetes, it is imperative that we slow down and think about what we're eating and that we prioritize exercise. Those are the two biggest things that you can do uh, to prevent diabetes. Or if your A1C is, is pre-diabetes, um, which is between 5.7 and 6.4, then you can actually turn that around and bring it down. And if you are a diabetic who's A1C is elevated, you too can bring that down um, with your diet and exercise. I am going to take a quick break for community rounds. Y'all, I need to talk to you and I need you to come close and I need you to listen even closer. <music> Community Rounds, the portion of the podcast where we take a look at what's going on in the community and develop a plan of care. Now, you know what's really a good time? Falling in love is a good time. Meeting somebody for the first time, seeing how much chemistry the two of you have. Depending on how fast or how slow you move, there may come a day when you want to get closer. 
A great idea for a date before jumping in the sheets is a trip to the clinic where you both get tested for sexually transmitted infections. Now, I know that doesn't sound sexy at all, but you know what else is not sexy? Gonorrhea, chlamydia, syphilis. You know, they're preventable. So why not prevent you and your partner from ever contracting them in the first place? Now, once upon a time, D the NP was a single little pre-NP and I understand the nuisance of condoms. I really do. I don't take it lightly when I say this, but y'all, they are just necessary. If you don't want to use condoms, then get tested before you bump uglies. Hi, mom. My mom listens to every episode of the podcast, so that's why I was saying hi. Mom, at least I'm not cussing, okay? So back to the topic. Condoms. STD screening, there's plenty of ways to get around contracting these pesky infections. A lot of the times there aren't even any symptoms for them and that's why I encourage all of you to go and get checked. Now, several ways you can do this. There's Planned Parenthood, there's freeclinics.com for affordable healthcare in your area. I'll put links in the show notes. Another way you can get tested is by going to Push Health. Push Health provides discrete laboratory testing because I know everybody contracting an STI is not getting it from the person that they're in love and in a monogamous relationship with. Let's be real. Some of y'all creeping. You don't want to take something home to the one you're supposed to be with, do you? Head over to Push Health and see how you can get discrete testing and treatment. Now, I was going to dig into the numbers, but rather than do that, what I think I'll do is send you all to the CDC's STI Twitter. You can find that at CDC STD on Twitter. If you can't find it, I'll be retweeting some of their tweets as well. The last thing I'm going to say about this is something that you may not know. When we start to see certain STIs on the rise, we know what's coming next. And what's coming next is HIV. Certain STIs make it much easier for HIV to get into your system. It's not something that you really want to play with. While we have better medication than we've ever had, prevention is key. So why not avoid it altogether? Don't forget to check the show notes for links to how you can get screened and treated. All right. Thanks for listening. Pass it on. Let's get back to the show. If you have a previously documented pre-diabetes, that's me. Hello. Remember I was telling you guys my A1C was 5.8. The A1C is a simple blood test that you get. It's also called a glycosylated hemoglobin. And it looks at the cells in your blood and lets us know what your average blood sugars are or where they range. So normal is going to be an A1C that's less than 5.7. A diagnosis of diabetes is going to be for an A1C of 6.5 or greater. And then 5.8 to 6.4 are going to be pre-diabetes. And as I told you all in the beginning of the episode, I am 5.8. So I'm right in there with you as far as working on turning this around and keeping a diagnosis of diabetes at bay or from ever happening at all. We can do that with food that we like to eat. We're pretty starchy. We like our starches as part of a meal, but if you're eating fresh food, that's going to be the best thing that you can do to avoid all that starch in your diet. The potatoes, the pastas, the bread, they're they're just full of starch and, and corn, which is in everything. Another reason why this fight can sometimes seem unfair, but just take the information and do your best with it. Exercise is another thing that is going to help us by bringing our blood pressure down, helping us achieve and maintain a healthy weight, and therefore 
decreasing our risk of developing diabetes. I didn't mention hypertension, but hypertension is another risk factor of blood pressure. Oh, this is so hard for me. My day job um, is focused on cardiology. So some resources, many resources will say hypertension is a blood pressure that's greater than 140 over 90. But as you all who follow me know, um, the guidelines recently changed. So we like to keep it even tighter, 120 over 80 and below. So those are the risk factors for diabetes. It's your ethnicity, your weight, whether or not you have hypertension, if you have a family history, and uh, if you were ever diagnosed um, as gestational diabetes during pregnancy. Getting tested is pretty simple, actually. It's a simple blood test. You just go, you get your blood drawn. You don't have to be fasting or anything. They just draw your blood. It can take a little while to come back, maybe a couple days, so be patient about that. And then you get a number. Now, I went over you know, normal pre-diabetic and diabetic numbers. But if you come back and you are someone who is diagnosed with diabetes for the first time, then there are some more things that you're going to want to do. The first of which is not to freak out. Um, Diabetes is an interesting illness because how well it's being managed fluctuates. You know, medications can make your sugar go up. Sickness, stress can make your sugar go up. Um, And then there are things that can make it come down. So it's one of those diagnoses that you don't just cure, you're always on a continuum. And you really want to develop really good habits, wellness habits, uh, to stay on the non-symptomatic end, on the end that's not going to give you all the early problems that we see in people who have diabetes. For diabetics, we aim for an A1C of less than seven, and that's pretty tight control. If we're not able to achieve that with diet and exercise, then we start introducing medications. And it's very important that this happens because Think of sugar in your blood like little shards of glass scratching up and fraying the inside of your vessels, and that can cause you a lot of problems down the road. We want to protect your blood vessels, we want to protect your heart, and we've got to get sugar down in order to do that. So being prescribed a medication is not the end of the world. In fact, it can really help you. There are pills that you can take. Usually that's what we start with is pills um, like metformin um, and and other medications that help bring your blood sugar down. Uh, One of the things to be very mindful of are symptoms of low blood sugar. And um, the reason for that is, like I mentioned earlier, you can feel like you can't even help yourself. So a person with diabetes should always have a snack nearby. Some of my favorite snacks are peanut butter and graham crackers um, and orange juice. I love orange juice. You're going to want something that will bring your blood sugar up fast like juice. There's some tablets that can help. um, You can dissolve in your mouth that can help with that as well. And then you're going to want something that's going to prevent your blood sugar from just bottoming out again. And that's where the protein comes in. If you're allergic to peanuts or you don't like peanut butter, um, just find like a, a protein bar or something that you can carry around with you and have so that you can help yourself uh, if you work long hours or don't get breaks or you get really busy studying or whatever you're doing that's keeping you from having snacks uh, and keeping your blood sugar more level, you're going to want to make sure you have something around to bring your blood sugar up if you get in a bind. Um, So people think diabetes, oh, I could never inject myself with insulin. We never just jump to insulin. I shouldn't say never. I should never say never. If you are late diagnosed and your A1C is very high, uh, they may suggest and and prescribe insulin right out of the gate. Uh, But typically, that's not what we do. Typically, we start with pills, work on lifestyle modifications, and monitor over time. Insulin 
can become a part of a diabetic's regimen. Prior to insulin becoming of a regimen, we like to set people up with diabetic educators. This is an appointment with someone who is very knowledgeable with regard to diabetes, who can assess what you've been doing, find the areas where there's opportunity for change or for improving your A1C, and check in with you throughout the process. They talk about what diabetes is, how it affects your body, what it makes you feel like, what you can do on your end to have better control of it, and also some things that you know, it does put you at risk for. So you get screened by asking your primary care provider for a simple blood test. Say, hey, I I think I should be screened for diabetes. Oftentimes, there can be an attitude amongst some medical practitioners where they kind of can blow you off and say, oh, you're, you're a healthy weight. You don't need to worry about that. Or, oh, you don't have anybody in your family uh, who has diabetes, so we don't need to worry about that. Guys, push the issue, and you can do that in a respectful way by saying, hey, I am African American, and I had a 10-pound baby two years ago. Those two risk factors together, I'd like to be tested, and I'm pretty sure that insurance will cover it um, because of those risk factors. Or if you're hypertensive and Pacific Islander, you know, if you've got two of those risk factors, just kind of push back a little bit to your provider and say, I know I don't look like the classic diabetic, um, whatever that looks like. Listen, uh, diabetes to me is like cholesterol. You can't look at somebody and know if they have high cholesterol or not. You can't look at somebody and know whether they have diabetes or not. Um, So yeah, get tested and follow up after the testing. Gave y'all a secret. I'll tell it to you again. When you leave the clinic, schedule a follow-up visit. Do it then so that when you have an issue later, you don't have to worry about getting in. If you don't have an issue, call with ample time and and cancel that appointment. But if you're making an appointment to get screened for diabetes, make sure you schedule a follow-up appointment to talk about your results. A lot of health clinics now have an electronic record that you can get access to. It's, I don't know what it's going to be called on every website individually, but I have an app called MyChart. And it gives me access to my records at multiple different places. My primary care provider's clinic, my cardiologist's clinic, my gynecologist's clinic. So I have a little app that holds all that information. And, you know, I'm a nurse practitioner, so I kind of monitor myself and know when I need to follow up on things. But I do encourage people to sign up for those electronic record access tools and ask your provider's office if you have access to something like that because it'll help you to partner in your care to follow your numbers to look at trends my a1c three years ago was 5.3 so it allowed me to kind of look back and go okay what has happened in the last three years what changes you know have i made unbeknownst or or, or subconsciously What changes have I made subconsciously that have affected this part of my health? And I encourage you to do the same. Should your kids get tested? That is a question uh, that I think all of us need to maybe sit with for a second because we don't routinely screen children for diabetes. That said, We're seeing more and more type 2 diabetes in kids. I mean, it's it's heartbreaking, really, because I think we lose some of the impact of some of these things because we hear them so much over time. But being somebody who has worked at the bedside, who's worked in the clinic, who have watched people deteriorate, over time from the effects of these diseases, I can tell you it's worth pressing the issue, finding out 
making the changes that you need to make. It is not, it's not something that I would wish on anybody. Um, People lose their limbs with diabetes. They lose their eyesight with diabetes. They lose their quality of life with That said, you guys, I have patients who have been diagnosed with diabetes for years and whose A1Cs are steady, who keep tight control with the food they eat, the exercise they get, you know, following up with their primary care provider and monitoring closely. So I don't want you to think that just getting a diagnosis is a death sentence. But it is serious and it's a reason to get screened. I love food just as much as anybody. But you know what? I love more than food. Seeing. I like my eyes and I like my feet. And I like, you know, going for walks and looking at my beautiful children and my dogs. And it is not worth the consequences of not knowing and letting something progress. It's scary to go in. It's scary to get screened. But it is empowering. Knowledge is power. And we can't do anything about what we don't know. I've included in the show notes some links where you can get tested for STIs. But you can also get tested those same places for diabetes. My big three when I do a new patient visit is a metabolic panel looking at electrolytes a lipid panel looking at cholesterol, and an A1C to screen for diabetes. I think it's important that we test, get that knowledge under our belt, and then figure out what we can do to be healthier. I want to thank all of you for listening to me ramble week after week. Go to my Instagram. Tell me what you want to hear about, learn about, talk about. What kind of guests you'd like me to have on? I'm excited for next week's episode. It's going to be fun. Come back and make sure you grab your college age student, heck, even your high school students, and let them listen in too. Take care, everyone. I'll talk to you next week. For listening to the Purple Stethoscope, I'm your host, Devin Nixon, family nurse practitioner. You can find me on social media at D the NP. That's on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and now Patreon. If you liked what you heard, go ahead and share this episode and then head over to Patreon to see how you can further support this work.